we are almost at the end of a wonderful series. I have been tremendously blessed by this particular series, uh, The Desert Lessons, lesson number 28. We only have two more um, sessions left in this particular series, then we're going to transition on to something else. Um, I hope you were blessed, brothers and sisters, by this series, and don't just di discard the, the study guides. Uh, put them in a safe place, because you'll never know where providence may lead you, and you may have to resort to these lessons um, to instruct someone in the ways of righteousness. Um, we are continuing under the caption, Strange Gods. Now, I really thought I could have gotten this done in four parts, but it is an impossibility. Um, but I can get it down in five. So while we have the fourth part, um, we will bring under this caption to a close, Strange God, um, when, when next we meet. Um, we're on lesson number four, friends. And I want to say this, that it has been a very moving um, series, a very taxing, but God is good. And I sh I'm sure you were blessed by this series. Now our, our thematic text, you should know it by heart. Now Romans chapter 15, verse 4. For what sort of things are written aforetime? are written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of scriptures, we might find hope. And I pray that you have gleamed and glistened hope from this particular series. Our thematic quote is from Testimonies to Ministers and Gospel Workers, page 31. Some of the Lord says that we have nothing to fear for the future except we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and his teachings in our past history. Friends, we have been highlighting three passages of scriptures for the past 30, 28 lessons now. First, um, Psalms 105, Psalms 106, and 1 Corinthians 10. Uh, we are told that these passages of Scripture should be read at least once per week by the people of God. Why? Because she says that they rehearse the history of ancient Israel. And as we see their falls, their follies, their, 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 their failures, I pray God that we are not repeating the history of ancient Israel. As we have been studying the, is the issue of jewelry, friends, we must understand that, that, that God does not change. And as we were, were told last week, Sons of the Times, May 19th, 1881, we're told, yet it is hard lesson for man to learn that God means what he says. Friends, he doesn't change. As a matter of fact, he doesn't need changing. We need changing. We are changing constantly, two or three times a day. But God is consistent from age to age. He remains the same. And we've discussed that time does not change God nor his truth. And the truth, the same prohibition that he gave to ancient Israel in regards to eating, dressing, drinking, marrying, these prohibitions are still uh, valid, current, relevant, modern, even this postmodern society. We've discussed that as they were about to enter the land of Canaan, they were given one last charge. They were told by, 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 by Joshua to Kodesh themselves. That word Kodesh, we learned, is a synonym to the word Tehar. And part of them Kodeshing themselves was that they had to take off the strange gods, which we know were earrings and fingerings and, and necklaces, and they gave them to Jacob in some case, and Jacob hid them under the hook of by shaking because he did not anticipate for them to put it on. As they were crossing over into Canaan, the earthy Canaan, they were told to sanctify themselves. And friends, nobody crossed over into Canaan wearing jewelry. And Canaan for us is a type of heaven. James White wrote that wonderful hymn, um, on the banks of old Jordan, here gazing I stand, and earnestly longing I stretch forth my hand. The hymn is called What Heavenly Music. Even James White realized that we as a people, we are encamped on the spiritual banks of Jordan. And that which was incumbent upon them is now left to us to do. We're going to have to sanctify ourselves. And friends, a part of sanctifying ourselves, brothers and sisters, is to put away the strange gods among ourselves and be clean. Now, friends, lest you misunderstand what I'm saying, and I'll say it again, in the words of Titus 3, verse 5, it's not by works of righteousness or right doing, which we have done, but according to his mercies, he saved us. And I want to say, friends, we are not saved by eating, dressing, drinking, 
putting on, putting off. We are saved solely, squarely by the merits of Jesus Christ. We can do nothing to add to that sacrifice. It was a perfect lamb. All that we do is just an outgrowth of our love, our appreciation for what Jesus did, is doing, and shall do. And so, friends, uh, taking off drill by itself will not get you to heaven. No, we, are, we, we, we will get to heaven by being obedient, yes, but by relying on the merits and the righteousness of our elder brother, Yeshua the Christ. But this does not take away works. Works has a place, but works are an outgrowth of that saving relationship with Jesus Christ. Spurgeon says, good works are not the cause of salvation, friends, but they are the result of it. And God wants the people who are willing to have him come in and work his perfect work in their lives. We have been looking at the issue of jewelry, a very touchy issue. And again, friends, let me say this, you know, the struggle is real. And there are millions out there. And, 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 and this is not taken away from their, their sincerity, their love for Jesus. They struggle. Some struggle with jewelry, some struggle with cosmetic, some struggle with food, some struggle with passion. Friends, as our faces differ, so do our struggles. And he, without sin, let him cast the first stone. So we're not here by any means condemning or even seeking to lessen or to state the fact that because a person wears jewelry that he or she is not a sincere Christian. I'm going, no, we're not even going near that, near that vein. What we are saying is, brothers and sisters, God in the Bible, the Bible is clear as to how God wants his people to look as they anticipate and wait for his soon coming. We've examined jewelry. I think this is the first I've ever dealt with in such a, a broad and extensive subject. You know, we deal with it during campaigns, maybe six or seven slides in a whole Christian lifestyle series. But this is the first I've ever dealt with jewelry uh, over probably for over five, 500 slides, 500 slides, four lessons, five lessons. And we've looked at jewelry from a historical perspective, allegorical, prophetically in the old and new. And we've discovered that whenever ancient Israel put on jewelry, uh, Put on jewelry, it was always a sign of apostasy and rebellion. And so to come back in harmony with God, they had to remove those things which, which, which drove a wedge between them and God. Now, friends, we're going to dis we'll be, we will be discussing this, this, these particular lessons, the wedding band. And again, let me, this is not, and I, friends, I want to be clear because we always have some, some extra zealous persons out there. And this is not license, legitimacy. <laughs> To, for you to go and harass people that may have a wedding band on, engagement ring on. This is not what we're seeking to do. And I would discourage that. If there is persons out there who may, who may be struggling with jewelry, you pray for them. And if the good Lord may impress upon your heart to give them a book or a track, let it be done with prayer and, and, and much tact. But this is not licensed for you to go around the church. Not like the church jury police. To, if you see a person on, and, none, that's, and don't tell them not to send you. Because I, I did not send you. I have not sent them. You're a false prophet, right? I, I'm not giving you that, that license. All I'm saying is let's pray for each other. And as the way opens up for, if God impresses you to go speak, then go ahead with tact and love and a Christ-filled personality. But outside of that, you just pray for them and live your life and let your life shine and that they will come to glorify God through your good works, right? Now, we're going to move right now into the issue of the wedding band. Again, it's in two parts because it is such a... Listen, it blew my mind. I, I must admit, friends, it, there's, I, I'm learning. And I'm sure you will learn as you study, right? Now, let's move right into the, the, this, this morning study now, right? Should God's people wear a marriage ring? Does a plain marriage band fall in the category of inappropriate ornaments of gold pearls mentioned by Paul and Peter in 1 Timothy 2.10 and 1 Peter 3.3? These questions have in, 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 in engendered endless controversies in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And even today, brothers, the issue of jewelry is and music. They are explosive issues 
It should not be because the Bible is plain. But friends, if you want to get barred from a church real quick, you speak on a wedding band. They will get you out of there quick, fast, and in a hurry. Right? Those who are in favor of the wedding ring feel strongly uh, that for them, the ring is a valuable symbol and affirm their marital status and commitment as well as a protection from un uninformed suitors. In other words, the wedding band has a mystical power of warding off uh, a man who may be looking for a wife or a woman, a husband, right? On the other hand, those who oppose wearing the wedding band feel strongly that, that, that a golden ring is an ornament forbidden by the, uh, in the apostolic admonition against wearing golds and pearls and costly real friends. One you may have, but not both. Is the, is the wedding band, does the wedding band fall under the same condemnation as, as what, the, what Peter says, gold and pearl in the New Testament? Now, we're going to begin, and we want to do a biblical survey of, of the wedding ring historically, and then we're going to bring it up to our day, pause, and we're going to um, bring it to its close next session. Now, number one, now again, friends, we're filling in the blanks. We are utilizing our scriptures, friends. You need to get your Bibles, get your pens. Friends, you need to mark these texts. I appeal to you. Number one says now, when the first marriage was performed in Eden, where were the gold and the precious stone? Where were they? Now, friends, in the book of Genesis chapter 127, we find these words now. So God formed man in his own image. In the image of God created him, male and female created them both. In verse 28 now, And so God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth over the fish and the sea, and over the fowls of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Friends, as we read these verses, many have drawn, and one more, Genesis 2.18, And the Lord God said, It's not good for man to be alone. I'm going to make him a help, a help me. And as you read verses 19, 20 on down, God created a, 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 a help meet for Adam. And from these verses, we have deduced that this was the first marriage performed in Eden. So where was the gold and the precious stones at the time when this holy matrimony sanctioned God did the wedding. Uh, I am saying, where were the gold and the silver at this time? Because remember, in Genesis, we have a pattern of all weddings. In other words, every wedding that followed should follow after this one, in principle. Now, in the book Patriarchs and Prophet, uh, a powerful book, I'm going through it for my devotion, we find this commentary on what we just read. We're told after the creation, Adam... After the creation of Adam, every living thing created was brought forth by before him to receive its name. He saw that to each had been given a companion, but among them there was not one found a helpmeet for him. Among all the creatures that God had made on the earth, there was not one equal to man. Are you with me? And God said, it is not good for man to, to be alone. I will make him a helpmeet. Somebody say, help meet the bills. Man was not made to dwell in solitude. Are you with me? He was to be a social being. Friends, I, and I detest these religion that seek to make uh, us, us monastic in our, our sphere. We have to be, yes, in the mountains, but also with the multitudes. John Wesley says, we cannot be Christians in solitude. There is a social life to Christianity, and it's by being social, coming close to the people, we can win their uh, affection and trust and then impart the truth for this time. She says now, without companionship, the beautiful scenes and delightful em employments of Eden would have failed to yield perfect happiness. She says now, after the creation, right? Eve was created now, so God decided to make Eve now. A help meet. The first union now, we're told Eve was created from, the, from a rib taken from the side of Adam. Why? Signifying she was not to control him as the head, nor to be trampled under his feet as an inferior, but to stand by his side as an equal, to be loved and protected by him. But we know after Eve sinned, the, the field was unleveled. Women now were were subjected to man and, and in most cases abused by man 
And this went on for say, and even today in some in certain countries, uh, the rights of women they don't even have any rights. You'd be surprised the amount of women today can't don't can't even learn how to read because they are in a male dominated society and they believe women don't have any rights, right? But it, it was not so from the beginning, right? No, we're told now a part of man, bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh, right? She she was to be his second self showing the close union and the affectionate att attachment that should exist in this relation. We're trying to figure out now where were the gold and the silver as they were brought forth and God married them both. We're told now God celebrated the first marriage. Hallelujah. God celebrates marriages that is done after the divine order. Everything that God had made was was of what was a perfection of beauty and nothing seemed wanting that could contribute to the happiness of the holy pair. now god now decides to give them a gift i wonder what that gift was now yet the creator gave them still another token of his love was it a wedding band did she get a diamond ring what did god give them now as a gift for their marriage we're told now here it is now by preparing a what a garden especially for their home that's what God gave them. The token that God gave them to bind their marriage was a home. And I want to say this. The greatest gift that a man can give to his wife is not so much a wedding band. It is a home, a habitation, a place where she can garden. This was the token that God gave Adam and Eve, brothers and sisters. And that is why in most cases, you know, even in Jewish culture today, that when, 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 when there's a marriage and the bride leaves, or the bridegroom. Who's the bridegroom? The man? The bridegroom okay. When the bridegroom leaves, when he gets married, he leaves his bride and he goes and prepare a place for his bride. And once that place is prepared, he now comes and get her. And remember, Christ is the bridegroom. The church is his bride. And so he has gone to prepare a place for us, a home, and it, it is finished. So here you see, you see the principle outplayed. Now, friends, We've seen the first marriage done. Now, I'm going to be quoting from another book now that will help complement or answer the question, where were the gold and the silver and the diamonds and rubies at the time when the first marriage was performed? Spiritual Gifts, another book written by Ellen White, another powerful book, four books, two books in four volumes, right? Powerful. She's now commenting on the chapter is entitled Crimes Before the Flood. She says now, um... The curse did not change at once the appearance of the, of the earth. After God had cursed the earth, uh, after Adam had Cain killed Abel, and then after, after Adam sinned, right? She says the curse did not change at once the appearance of the earth. It was still rich in bounty. God had provided for it. For it. Here it is now. There was gold and silver in where? In abundance, friends. Where were the gold and silver? Not under the earth. These things were on the earth. They were walking on gold and precious stones. The people now use the silver, precious stones, and choice wood in building their houses for themselves, striving to excel each other. And in some cases, she says now, they beautified and adorned their houses and lands with the most in in uh, ingenious works and that provoke their God, these are wickedness. They form images and they worship them and, and they taught their children to worship these images, friends. So here we see the gold and the silver that we kill, that we crave for, were on the ground at the time of the wedding. And God never took a ring and formed and fashioned it and say, Here, Eve, with this ring, wed. This, is a, this, this will keep off, this will ward off suitors. No, friends. The gold and the silver remain on the earth. Now, look what happened now. After the flood, another book I'm reading now, it's from Eternity Past by Ellen White, powerful book. She now, she, she's now commenting on what happened to the gold and the silver after, and the precious stones after the flood. She says now, after the flood now, she says, the mountains, once beautiful, had become broken and, and irregular. This is now after the flood. Ledges and ragged rocks were now shattered upon the surface of the earth, where once had been earth's richest treasures of gold, silver, and precious stones, were seen the heaviest marks of the curse. Wow, did you get that, friends? 
let, 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 me, let me break it down. Today, where we find the richest deposits of gold, silver, diamonds, sin rested the heaviest at that spot. You didn't get that. That's, that's Africa. That's Africa. Then she says now, uh, and upon countries not inhabited, those where there had been the least crime, the curse rested lightly. So you find today, well, what's the answer? The answer is now, the gold was on the surface of the ground. That's where the gold, I didn't have to go excavate anything. It was right. God, God called these things into existence. They lined the earth's surface. And I could imagine when the sun, it would glisten and gleam. Friends, after sin, look how, look what man had to do now to reach these precious stones that we now crave, we go in debt for. They now have to dig. And again, we're talking Africa. Because, friends, we don't find no diamond in no Europe. <laughs> they, they have been exported to Europe, yes. But, friends, it tells me that civilization began in Africa. Well, that's just given. I mean, come on, man. We don't have to really guess that. That's just, that's just, that's just elementary. So here we see all that part of the world. Today, um, miners and excavation have been done at the cost of people's lives to unearth these precious stones of gold and silver, which once rested upon the earth. But my point is now, friends, after sin now, we know Adam and Eve left the Garden of Eden. They were expelled, expelled from the Garden of Eden. And we like to say as Adventists that there are two institutions Adam and Eve took from the Garden of Eden. One was what? The Sabbath institution and the what? The marriage but when they left Eden, they never took the wedding band because there was no wedding band used in the Garden of Eden to sanction the first wedding that God performed. So the question is now, when and where did the wedding band come into play? We need to now discuss now the origin of this piece of metal. Number two now. Which nation in scripture do we first find the finger ring associated with? Which nation is first known for using finger rings biblically? Genesis chapter 41. We know the story. Joseph was brought from the dungeon and as he interpreted Pharaoh's dream, Pharaoh was so blessed. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 41, 42 now, and Pharaoh took off his ring from his hand and put it upon Joseph's hand and arrayed him in a vesture of fine linen and put a gold of chain upon his neck. Well, you say, oh, hold on, preacher. Joseph was a good man. If Joseph allowed Pharaoh to put a, a finger on his finger and upon his neck, why can't I put it on? Well, you ain't Joseph. You're not Joseph. And you have to read the context. But friends, here we see the first fingering mentioned in the Bible we can trace it back to the Egypt, to Egypt or the Egyptians. I'm not saying that it may not have predated uh, Egypt, but from a scriptural perspective, the first mention of a ring on a finger, it doesn't say, they didn't say which finger, but we know the nation of Egypt were the first nation that we can associate wearing thing ringers on, 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 on finger, right? Now, stand up now, please read for me now. Uh, no one can. Note, no one can tell for certain how far back the ring goes. Finger rings appear to have originated with the ancient Egyptians, evolving from the seal or signet. Mm -hmm. Because the seal was a sign of power, the wearer of a portable seal, a signet ring, was regarded as a person of great authority. The signet ring is the earliest type of ring mentioned in the Bible. So up until this point, brothers and sisters, we, we, have not, we haven't found the wedding ring being brought into society. Now, it is true now, the signet ring, um, it began to appear amongst God's people as a sign. Uh, when Tamar disguised herself as a harlot to entice her father-in-law Judah, she asked for him his signet cord or staff as a pledge for his promise to send to, to, to send to her right 
Jeremiah informs us that the Israelites wore signet rings on their right hand, right? Ashuash, Ashuash gave his signet ring to Haman to seal it the royal decree. Upon the return of the prodigal son, uh, 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 he received a ring from his father, a symbol of, 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 of dignity. So here we see that as the centuries roll on, the signet ring was very prominent in Bible time, but we did not, we haven't found the wedding ring. So we need to find out at where, at what junction in history did the wedding band appear. Now, it leads now to the next section now, what was called the betrothal ring. Now, the betrothal, betrothal ring. Now, number three now, the art of using rings in connection with betrothal marriage originally began with which nation? Now, we're going to fast forward now, friends. Historically, it found its etymology, its genesis, its origin in the nation of Rome. We're talking about ancient Rome now, pagan Rome where the Caesars um, ruled, not so much uh, Christian Rome. The genesis of using ring. Now, friends, you got to get this, saints. We know that the Romans were pagan, 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 and still pagan. They were, they were pantheistic. And by the way, by that time, Greek, Greece was coming off the scene. So we had Greco-Rome and Greece had heavily influenced Roman culture, Roman society. You talk about Greek mythology, friends, I was there. That was my Achilles heel, boy. I used to love me some Iliad all the way. And, and remember, the, the Rome had their pantheon. And, and I'm, I'm heading somewhere now. And in their pantheon uh, were gods. Jupiter, all the gods they worship. So the Romans themselves were a pagan nation, brothers and sisters. They were pagan. In the words of LMA, Moses Mason, they were pagan, pagan, pagan. And they were still pagan. And it was in this society that Christianity now had to thrive. All this paganism that were around them. So we can, and I'm going to show you that historically it began with the nation of Nob. I'm reading from the Encyclopedia Britannica. Because some of us, we won't believe anything unless we see it on CNN. Now this is the books, friend. This is history. This is not, these are not my words. This, this, is, this is documented. You can't just say this is hearsay. This is fact. Now I'm quoting now from the Encyclopedia Brit Britannica. And this is now, they are now commenting on the history of the wedding ring now. Right? Bethrothal ring, pardon me. So now please read now. The bethrothal ring. Mm -hmm. The bethrothal ring. The Romans were also the first to use finger rings to tie people, not only to their social classes, but also to their marital partners. During the bethrothal ceremony, the bridegroom gave a plain iron finger ring to the family of the bride as a symbol of his commitment and financial ability to support the bride. Now remember, in this culture, marriages were oftentimes decided not by love, but over the, the table. As a matter of fact, for many, many centuries, women did, had no say. Even today in some, um, you know, in the, in the African that continent, in that, that part of the world, you know, Middle East, today women don't have any say. Only in North America, they tell you who they want to marry. But in other parts of the world, no, they had to sit down and the father negotiated their marriage. And it was always on the basis of not because she loved him, no, because the ching ching, the dollar bill. Right? Now, the encyclopedia, people are reading now, keep on reading now, uh-huh. The Encyclopedia Britannica states, the giving of a ring to mark a betrothal was an old Roman custom. All right, now. The ring was probably a mere pledge, pignus, that the contract would be fulfilled. In Fl Flinny's time, about 70 AD... Now, hold on. Flinny's is a, is a historian, and I'm going to show you his book, right? Please read now. Conservative custom still required a plain ring of iron, but the gold ring was introduced in the course of the second century. This use of the ring, which was thus of purely secular origin, received ecclesiastical sanction and formulate of benediction of the ring exists from the 11th century. So friends, when this came on the scene now, it, sometime in history, the church sanctioned this. 
and it became the norm in society. Now, bear in mind, our friends, it was in this culture, right, that we, we were reading, Peter saying, not with gold or pearl or costly arrays, right? It was in this culture. So one can also deduce that in, in denouncing gold and silver in the Roman context of the Roman Christians, Peter was also making a reference or, or inference, reference to the wedding ring because it was in the Roman society. And we learned last Sabbath. Now, we also believe, friends, that, that there is an astro astrological and myth uh, mythological connection with the, with the wedding ring. It is tied to astrology and mythology. This is history now. Now, does the betrothal marriage ring have a connection with Greek mythology and astrology? Friends, yes. Yes, yes, yes. As a matter of fact, I'm going to tell you, friends, the worst piece of jewelry you can put on is a wedding band. I'm being honest, brothers and sisters. This, I, I can't sugarcoat it. The worst piece of jewelry you can put on is the wedding ring. If you understood the origin of it, I'm going to show you. And what it stood for, you would get that thing off your finger and beg God for forgiveness and have mercy upon you and to seal your marriage with his, with his spirit. Now, in the book, How It All Began, by Paul Brenner, we find these words now. Please read. In his book, How It Began, Paul Bernadier mm -hmm. claims that the binding use of the ring for betrothal ceremonies developed from an older superstitious practice in which a man tied cords around the waist, wrists, and ankles of the woman he had fallen in love with to make sure that her spirit would be held under his control. Wow, interesting, brothers and sisters. What, 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 what is, friends, that, that, that is Greek method, that is, that is spiritualism. And you know, today, you know, e e even, even in the Jamaican culture today, we still echo the same sentiments. For instance, we would say, and it's, it's been said, you know, when a man is, when a man loves a woman so much where he can't break loose of her, the, the, the society would say, she has tied him. Or him, him tie her. <laughs> and they would oftentimes say, when you go to a certain part of the, you know, the island, don't eat from them, them girls because they will tie you. They will tie you with their food. Or, so they, they, they have a mystical, a mystical encampment, a enchantment over you. Now, friends, this by itself is paganism. It is heathenism. But you can see the formulation of a circle being tied. Now, let me quote another credible source. I'm going back to the Encyclopedia Britannica. Now, Flinney's Natural history is cited also in this. Now, believe it or not, brothers and sisters, history shows that the history of the wedding band has its origin in Greek mythology. Now, please read now. This is from the Encyclopedia Britannica now. Please write now. The use. The use of a ring to tie a person to a social class may have derived from the legendary origin of the fingering. All right. In his natural history, um, Pliny tells us. All right, that Pliny is 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 this now, right? It's a good book to get, right? Now, go ahead. Now, sorry, uh huh. Pliny tells us that the ring first entered Greek mythology when Prometheus dared to steal fire from heaven for earthly use. Mm -hmm. For this wanton crime, Zeus chained him to a rock upon in the Caucasus Mountains for 30,000 years, during which time a vulture fed daily on his liver. So this is Greek mythology, brothers and sisters. This is Greek. And, and listen, if, 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 you, if you watch, I'm not going to go watch it. If, you wa if you've ever watched the Iliad, this is alluded to in the Iliad, right? The, or the Odyssey is alluded to it, right? Now, after reading, go ahead. Now, after... Str After straining at the chain for many years, <laughs> uh -huh. Prometheus finally succeeded in breaking away, taking a chunk of the mountain with the chain. All right, now. Eventually, Zeus relented and liberated Prometheus from the chain. However, to avoid a violation of the original judgment, Prometheus was ordered to wear a link of his chain on one of his fingers as a ring. All right, go ahead now, uh-huh. 
On the ring was set a piece of the rock to which he had been chained as a constant reminder that he was bound to the rock. But this is, that's history. That came from ancient Greece. That's Greek mythology. And many believe that, this, that the principle of, of binding someone together with a wedding ring and a rock, it emerged out of Greek mythology. And that is why, friends, even in the first century Christianity, they never used wedding bands. It, 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 was, it was denounced because they understood the Greek connotation to it. In the book, The Ring Through the Ages and Informal History, James Ramington McCarthy has this to say. He says now, so, so we see it's tied, it is all, it's tied to mythology. It is also tied to astrology. What is astrology? It means that the, the planets govern your lives. People would oftentimes ask me, what's your sign? You move like a Scorpio. Yes, Scorpio was my sign in the days of my honor generosity. Today my sign is seven day Sabbath. But we, it still believes today that your, the stars dictate and determine your destiny. He goes on to say from this book now that astrology is the belief that stars influence the destinies of people was popular among the Chaldeans, the Egyptians, the Greek, and the Romans now. And it has flourished in the Western world even to our time until the 17th century astrological finger rings were very popular. Now look at the connotation now with astrology and the finger rings. Because we believe that the wedding band in its history is tied to astrology. Note now, these rings, here it is now, these rings developed out of belief that heavenly bodies have a special influence over nations, cities, individual. They can affect person's personal appearance, temperament, disposition, character, health, and fortune, etc. Now, to court the, to court the help of planetary deities, it was important to wear rings formed of gems and metals assigned to each of the several planetary gods. So each god has a special ring, and in that ring was a special stone. He goes on. So in other words, now, you'll find that now there are seven planetary gods, seven planets, right? So the sun god, his, his stone was a diamond. And you're going to find that, they would, that, that, that if, if they want to court his favor, they had to wear that ring. Then we had now the moon. The right hand was, a, was a, 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 a crystal on a silver ring. So you find that the, the, the sun god had a diamond or a sapphire on a golden ring. And that is why, isn't it ironic that the diamond is still the most chosen stone in wedding bands? And it's, it's on a gold ring, right? The moon, a crystal on a silver ring. Mercury, a magnet on a silver quick. Then we had Venus, Amethyst on a copper ring. Mars, Emerald on an iron ring, Jupiter uh, 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 on a tin, Lord have mercy, and then Saturn on lead. And so you find that each ring, each stone would invoke the presence, the protection, the blessings of a certain God. Greek mythology. He goes on to say now, these various rings set with different precious stones were worn according to the preference of the planetary gods whose help they sought. For instance, a related development uh, occurred just before the beginning of Christianity when the Romans adopted from the Jews the seventh day of the week use right today. Prior to that time, the Romans had used an eighth day week known as Nomoindum. Now, now, when the Romans adopted the seventh day of the week, they decided to name each day of the week after a planet which allegedly controlled the day sun, for the sun god, moon, the moon god, etc. The Jewish custom was uh, to designate the days of the week by the number. Now, friends, I must stop there. In other words, first, second, etc. In other words, and I say this, God never asked us to keep such a day. He said, keep the seventh day. You're not going to find Saturday, Sunday, Monday in Genesis. No, these were pagan names given by the Romans to the days. The Jewish was the first, second, third, fourth day. Now, the reason why we worship on Saturday is because, because of the calendar. Saturday happens to line up 
with the seventh day. But friends, just say hypothetically. Hypothetically, if Tuesday was the seventh day, we'd be worshiping on Tuesday. Not because of the name of the day, because of the numerical attachment. Watch it now, friends, right? This belief that each day of the week was controlled by a planet god led to the development of fingering set with stone favored the planet god controlled uh, uh, controlling the day. In other words, now, wealthy people wore different rings each day according to the stone preference of the planet controlling God that day. Apollonius and Taina and Pythagoras, philosopher of the first century, offer the following list of finger rings set with different precious stones to be worn on the proper planetary day of the week to ensure the favor of the celestial in friend. This is pagan, 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 all pagan. And again, as we said, Rome had their pantheon. There were several gods in the pantheon. Now, here, here's a list. Now, this is history. For instance, now, we have the days, the gem of the day, and then we had the astral control. So you find if you wanted the favor of the sun god, you would not wear a ruby. So they had several, they had a ring for each day. And according to the day, but again, the chief of the god was the sun god. And because he was the chief, naturally, you would attribute the most precious gem to that god which was the diamond, right? And pearls were, that's why Peter says not with gold or pearl, because back then, pearls. Today, you could care less about some pearls. But back then, pearls were the thing. If you had some pearls, you were, you were, you were the end thing. And diamond. And you can see Sunday, diamond. Monday, pearl. Tuesday, ruby. Wednesday, amethyst, and, and, uh, and it goes on all the way down. Friends, it's tied to Greek mythology. It's a pagan, it's, it's of a pagan origin. Now, note now, please read now. What have been mentioned? What has been mentioned? What has been mentioned should suffice to show that the origin of the betrothal or marriage ring is to be found in pagan superstitions and idolatrous practices. The pagan origin and meanings of the finger ring raise questions about the legitimacy of its adoption by God's people to represent marital commitment. And friends, remember, as we go through the Bible, from the first marriage all the way down to Rome, God's people never use rings to legitimize, to sanction their marriage. It was always a vow between God and the one whom you have chose for your partner. Go ahead now, in the Bible? In the Bible, the value of symbols is determined by their, or, by their origin and meaning. All right now. The Sabbath, the Passover lamb and blood, the Lord's Supper, baptism, and foot washing are all valuable symbols because they have been established by God to help us conceptualize and internalize spiritual realities. But God never established a wedding band in any sense for us to use it as a sigmund or a sign to say we are married. And brothers, if you think that the wedding band is going to ward off to this, think again. Think again, brothers and sisters, right? Their, please, their, their value. Their value is derived from their divine origin, All right, meaning now. and function. Uh -huh. By contrast, the meaning of the wedding ring is a symbol of marital commitment, finds its origin not in scripture, but in pagan mythology and superstitions. Yeah, it is, friends. It is, listen, listen, friends, I'm going to be blunt with you. I've got to be blunt and frank. Friends, the wedding band is as pagan as Sunday. As a matter of fact, it came off the same vein. So if one, you cannot denounce one without denouncing the other. And that is why, brothers and sisters, even in the Adventist church, up until the, the mid-80s, ministers would never, you know, even if, even if they were marrying an, an, an unbeliever, they would not do the, the, the ring ceremony. They would not. They would marry the unbeliever, yes, but they said, you know what, because of our, my belief system, I cannot put the wedding band on. They, they never did it. And that's for unbelievers. Brothers and sisters, I have a research that says 
90% of the weddings that are performed in North America are done with wedding bands. And researchers show, brothers and sisters, that the millennials, that 90, 95%, I can show you the research, are the, are the marriages done by millennials are with wedding band. So what, how did we as a people adopt this pagan symbol when former generations did not do it? I'm going to show you, brothers and sisters. I'm going to show you. Therefore, now to invest, please read now. To invest a pagan symbol with a sacred Christian meaning can easily lead to a secular, secularizing of the symbol itself. As we shall see, this is exactly what has happened with the use of the wedding ring. The pagan superstitions surrounding the origin of the Roman betrothal ring did not deter early Christians from adopting its use. So friends, as the Christians were in Rome, now you can see why Peter and Paul wrote these two powerful texts, not with gold or pearls, over and over. He wrote to the church, Paul wrote to the church, Paul also wrote, Peter wrote to the wives in the house. You can see why, it, because it was of a pagan origin. Now friends, the fourth finger. This is, this is important now. I'm saying, I'm saying this thing is baptized paganism four square. It blew my mind, brother. This is history now. Number five now. What finger is the wedding ring placed on and why? Have you ever wondered? Friends, we've been, we've been to countless weddings. Some of you have it on. Have you ever wondered why? Okay, what finger? Obviously, it's the fourth finger. Now, now fourth from the thumb. You start counting from this one, you get the second. Now, why, brothers and sisters? You got, you got, you got five fingers. You got five fingers. Why or who told you? Who told you that the wedding ring should be worn on the fourth finger? Where did you get that from? Friends, you, we, we, so we, we just adopt things and we do not know the origin. Why and why the left hand and not the right hand? Why not the thumb? You see, the height of intelligence is, is questioned. You got to question these things. Why the fourth finger? And why the left hand? Why I've never seen a man marrying a woman and put the wedding on the thumb? Why not the index finger? Or the middle finger? Or the pinky finger? Why the f what, what's so special about this finger as opposed to this? As a matter of fact, I'm going to tell you something. The most important finger on the hand is the thumb. Did you know that, brothers and sisters? If you lose your thumb, you're in trouble. Or your big toe. Did you know that? As a matter of fact, I, 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 I was watching a documentary on Bob Marley and when he got the cancer and you know it's been discussed how he got it there's so many different shades out there but nevertheless he, he got the cancer it was in his big toe now he could have been alive today you know had he amputated his big toe cut it off but the one reason why Bob Marley objected based on the, 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 the what was said your big toe is your center of gravity in other words if you lose your big toe somehow you can't it's amazing how the body is. If your big toe is, is, is severed, your gravity is off. And because it was said Bob Marley, he doesn't sit on a guitar on a stool and play. That brother rock and him skunk and him did all that stuff. So if he had lost his big toe, he could not perform as he should. That's why he didn't cut it off. And so, you know, he succumbed to cancer. He died in Miami. He, I think about 34 or 30, in his, in his mid 30s. Pretty young. But my point is, friends, out of all the most important finger on your hand is not the middle finger. Listen, if you cut this finger off, you can, you can function. You cut the thumb off, you's in trouble. You's in trouble. So why the fourth finger? Friends, again, I am, I am quoting, unfortunately, I have to quote. I'm quoting the Catholic Encyclopedia. Now, you know it's bad when I have to, when I have to, I have to go down in Babylon, brothers and sisters, to get, to, get to get some truth to give to you, brothers and sisters. And as vile as that system is, they tell the truth sometime. This is what the Catholic Church says now in regards, this is history, in regards to why we use, why the wedding band is placed on the, and this is public knowledge, you can go, you can Google this if you want. Please read that now. The ring is given. The ring is given by the espouser to the espoused, either for a sign of mutual fidelity or still more to join their hearts by this pledge. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the ring is placed on the fourth finger because a certain vein, it is said, flows thence to the heart. 
The use of rings in wedding ceremonies is traced back to the early part of the 4th century. So there's, a, so there's a link now to this finger and to the heart. Look what it says now. The belief. The belief that the fourth finger, counting from the thumb, has a vena amoris, a love vein, running directly to the heart. The annular ring, finger, shares the same route to the heart as the other fingers. In spite of its superstitious origin, the custom of wearing the wedding ring on the fourth finger of the left hand has prevailed in the most Christian countries to this day. Friends, if that's not some paganism, I don't know what is, brother. As a matter of fact, when I read that, you know what comes to my mind? Our, our ideology, where a person, and you know, we talked about it in the, in the series Soul Train, the Eastern Man, where they can look, where they believe that, you know, uh, uh, reflexology, where your foot, there's veins on your, your, your five toes, each is connected to a liver. Or they can look in your eyes and diagnose you. Friends, to think that a vein from your finger runs to your heart, and because you place that, 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 that ring on that finger, it invokes some kind of love. Friends, you are deceived. But, but that is the history of why the ring is played. There is no other excuse. And if that's the case, then why not put it on any finger? Why have we stuck to the fourth finger? Friends, this is, I'm telling you, the worst piece of jewelry you can put on is the wedding band. It is, it is steeped in mythology. It is steeped in astrology. And for an Adventist in the light of what we know to have anything to do with astrology, shame on you. Friends, we run from that kind of stuff. You know how we are. We run from astrology. We run from anything that, that is re remotely tied Spiritual. to spiritualism. That's the three unclean spirit, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. And the thing that binds together is, the, is spiritualism. Mm -hmm. And the Bible says, you know, in the time of our ignorance, God winks. But after today, he ain't winking anymore. No, like I'm not here giving you license to go and chastise people and to tell them that your ring is mythology. We're not, we're, no, don't even go there. This is an issue you have to settle with God for yourself. You have to work this thing out with fear. Every year, millions of dollars is spent on sanctifying the marriage with a sign that had no, no, no origin from God. The wedding ring is just as pagan as Sunday. Friends, I, I got to tell you the truth. Mm. And you're, gonna, you're finding more and more pastors in Adventist church wearing it, especially the millennials. Mm -hmm. It's a common thing. First, it was the wives. Mm -hmm. Then the pastors, friends, and from the pastors of the congregation, friends, I'm going to show you that. The wedding ring has been the most detrimental piece of jewelry in the Adventist church because what it has done, it has opened the door. There is a pandemic in the church today with Julia and friends. Only God knows where it will end. The falling away. Now we learned last Sabbath that even after the apostles passed off the scene, Peter died in 60 AD ish, and Peter and, 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 and Paul, even 200 years later, even the apostles, the apostles' creed prohibited the wearing of any kind of gold. So there was no marriage in the New Testament Christian that was sanctioned. And if they did it, they were, they were in rebellion. But it was never sanctioned by the apostles. It was never sanctioned by the literature. So at what point in history now did the wedding band become the norm in the early church? Now, number six now, what did the apostle Paul predict would happen to the apostolic standards of the early church? The apostle Paul is a prophet and he knew he wasn't going to be around forever. And he wrote these solemn words. He said now in, in, in 2 Thessalonians 2, 1, he says now, Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come except there be a what? Falling away, he predicted. And that falling away now, who would arise? The man of sin be revealed, son of perdition. The man of sin is the Catholic church. So he predicted there was going to be a falling away. In other words, now, the, 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 the prohibition that, the, that, 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 that was put forth by Peter and Paul, those prohibition against jewelry would be discarded as the years roll on. 
And friends, so said, so done. In about 300 years after the, the death of the Apostle Paul, to so the fourth, fourth century, brothers and sisters, the jewelry, especially the wedding band, the wedding band first, it began to re-emerge re in Christianity and it opened the door. And, the, and the, the, believe it or not, the church that sanctioned it was the, was the Catholic Church. They sanctioned it now. Watch it now, right? No, please. What happened in pagan Rome was repeated in the Christian church. As pagan Rome, so in the Christian church, the betrothal ring became a sig signal plain iron band to express congenial fidelity. But it soon evolved to elaborate gold rings set with gems to display wealth and pride and vanity. So it was a little old band. Then the band, all of a sudden, a big old rock evolved and the rock kept getting bigger and bigger and just bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and one turned to two and two to three. I've seen ladies wearing their wedding band. They have one on this finger and they have the wedding bang and the engagement ring. Hold on! The issue we're dealing with now was the wedding band. At what now, in our culture, what comes first? The wedding or the engagement? So, how do we arrive at the engagement ring now? If we're dealing with the wedding band that was performed at the wedding, at what point did the engagement ring come, come on the scene? Now, right, we're told now, this was true not only for the laity but also the clergy. The, the concession that the church leaders made for Christians to wear only a marital ring soon became the pretext for wearing all kind of rings on the finger. So once the church gave the sanction, it opened the door, not just for the laity, but for the clergy. And the clergy began to put it on. And one of the first, one of the first finger ring that appeared in the Catholic Church was what we call the, 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 the ring of the fisherman. Yes. Now, this is what every pope has worn. The ring, and who is in it? That's the fisherman. Who was the fisherman and disciple? Peter. So what, and why did Peter wear jewelry? Peter told us, don't put it on. So how in the world did they, did they craft a ring after Peter? And every pope, it's called the fisherman ring. Every pope has it. There it is. And what hand is it on? The right hand. What finger? The the Interesting. Mm -hmm. The same finger where the wedding band is on, brothers and sisters. You're not going to find no pope putting no a fisherman ring on his index finger. Why that finger? Now, look at it now. This is Pope Francis, the current pope, and he has the, what is called the fisherman ring, which they claim, and here it is, Pope Ratzinger, his predecessor, right? And they claim that it was Peter wore it, because Peter was the first pope. Peter wasn't no pope. Peter wasn't even a Catholic. Peter was a Jew that crossed over to Christianity. Peter was not no pope, and Peter didn't die in no Rome. And in, in Rome, they have St. Peter's Basilica. This Peter, this madness. The fisherman ring. That was the first ring that the church validated. And believe it or not, friends, isn't it ironic? If you study, if you go back in history, right, and you get Alexander Hislop with two Babylon, and you get the book Josiah William Sutton, Antichrist 66, you'll find that this ring right here, that, that this, this is not Peter. Do you know who it is? It's Jupiter. It's not Peter, it is actually Jupiter. Remember, I told you, Rome had the pantheons. And their pantheons were God, and all they did were just, they just changed the name of the gods. In other words, now, what we call Peter is really Jupiter. Rome. And you see the eagle? That's in the Bible class. Where the eagles are, thither, the will be gathered. Rome's symbol was the eagle. So here we see this statue that is in Rome today, and it was said that, Every time they pass Peter, they rub his big toe and kiss it till the big toe, had to, big toe fell out. They had to get a mason to fix it back on. But friends, this is not Peter. Historical, this is Jupiter. This is baptized paganism. And we are told it was the compromise between Christianity and paganism that gave birth to the Catholic Church system. The Catholic Church system was never a Christian church. It is a jacket. 
That's a bad word for saying that boy is a bastard. It's a bastard religion. It was birthed out of paganism. It is not a Christian religion. Stop, stop calling it that. Now there are sincere people in the organization which God is going to call out. But as it, as, as, as it stands, John calls it the abomination of the earth. The mother of all hearts, brothers and sisters. And God is going to rain on fire on Rome one of these days. Darkness is the fifth plague. And the Bible says that darkness falls at the season of the beast. You know why? Because Rome is responsible for the spiritual darkness that is in Christianity today. Friends, do not confuse the fisherman ring. And that is not Peter. And Peter never had no fisherman ring. Peter never wore jewelry. Now, he may have worn it before he came to Christ. But after Pentecost, he got that stuff off. And what has happened, brothers and sisters? Look what happened now. You see, once the early church gave license to the wedding ring or the betrothal ring, it opened the door to every species of jewelry. And the Bible says, a little leaven, leaven it a whole lump. Brothers and sisters, you cannot play with sin. Sin will keep you longer than you plan to stay and take you further than you plan to go. You can't play with sin. You give the devil an inch, him take a yard. Somebody says a mile. And wants to do it once, once. And brothers and sisters, what happened in the early church? Since it happened in the history of the Adventist church. I'm going to read an article to you. An article to you. This is not in the lesson, but it will be in the next lesson. Because next week, we're going to discuss next, next lesson, how the wedding band came into the Adventist church. Now, this is now, I'm quoting from Roger Kuhn. He was the associate secretary of the Ellen White estate. And he wrote on the wedding band, Ellen White and the Seventh Adventist church. This is what he said now. As he saw the wedding band coming into the church, look what he said now. Please read now. Stand on. No, not in your hand. I'll take a picture now. He, what he says now. Please read now. It has been indeed. It has indeed and in fact opened the door to jewelry generally. The wedding band. Please read now, right? And it has paved the way for the tactic acceptance of other rings. Uh -huh. Engagement rings, class rings, friendship rings, etc. So stop. So in other words, the issue in the Adventist church, they just had a, they just had a wedding ring. But they say, if, if I get the wedding ring, I need an engagement ring. So it moved from the wedding ring, a plain old wedding ring, to an engagement ring, from an engagement ring to a big old rock in the middle, and it has to become elaborate. And he says, now, it opened the door for a class rings. Brothers, you have young people today who, when they leave the academy uh, and, and college, they get themselves their college rings and not just that friendship rings and all kind of rings because we allow the wedding band to come in brothers it opened the door and today there is a pandemic with jewelry you have people in our churches all friends worshiping god with big old hoops in the air they're not visitors these are Adventists in quote unquote good and regular sense and these weak insipid mamby pamby hortatory pastors they say nothing because if you say something, sisters, they call a conference, the conference come out on you, and that, that good old paycheck, and that retirement, and retirement is only good when you're alive. When you're dead, it's no use. So they are silent and year in, year on, strange gods are on the people of God in the most solemn day of the year, the day of atonement. It's the norm today, friend. You don't even hear these sermons today, brethren. You have to come in somebody's home and hear these, these brethren. You don't hear these admonitions. And I, listen, I have, I have, I have uh, uh, um, church manuals that as far back as 1920s. And the stand that we took on the wedding bank back then, it ain't the same stand today. Now, has God changed? What about not with gold or pearl? Are those texts allegorical? Was Peter speaking in prophetic terms when he meant, or was it real? Please read now. On the hands of Seventh-day Adventist church members, 
But the lessening of opposition to the wearing of the wedding band on the campuses of some of our colleges in North America in the early 1970s, we find a more complex problem with jewelry in the early and mid 1980s. And we are in 2020, get ready 21. And it said, this thing has taken over. And we can trace it back to the wedding band. It is like Pandora's box, boy. Once we open the door, once we let the members wear that in North America, it opened the door. And today, the jewelry is, is in some congregation, it's, 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 it's whatever, it's like nothing. No, it's not, because God has not changed. Now, friends, we are told that history is going to repeat itself. Solomon says, that which was is that which shall be. And that which is done is that which shall be done and there is no new thing under the sun. As a matter of fact, brothers and sisters, as we wind down, I want to keep you along this time. I'm setting the stage for the next installment. We're going to show you that the wedding band must be put away from the people of God. We are in the day of atonement, brothers and sisters. That thing needs to go and especially what it symbolizes. Note, the saying that history repeats itself applies in a special way to the history of the wedding ring. What happened to the early church during the Middle Ages has been repeated in the internal history of the remnant church. We have found that the early church, in the early church, the use of marital rings evolved through three main stages. Here it is now, and the same happened today. Number one, in the first stage of the apostolic period, there was no apparent use of marital rings. You're not going to find that in the book of Acts. And there were plenty of weddings that were, that, 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 were, that were performed. You're not going to find no wedding band used. Zero. Zilt. Because the early Christians knew what the origin of the wedding band was. It is laced in mythology, astrology. It is pagan, pagan, and still pagan. Now, the second stage of the of the third and fourth century, there was, there was a concession to use the wedding ring as a symbol to affirm marital status and commitment. And once they gave that now, Lord have mercy. In the third and final stage from the fourth century onward, there was a proliferation of all kinds of ornamental rings and jewelry. And this went on for years, for years, for almost 1260 years and then the reformation came and we learned last sabbath man like wesley and spurgeon these men came trying to re-echo re the sentiments of the early church but the wedding ban opened because after all who would argue with a ban that's gonna solidify somebody's marriage marriage is a beautiful thing so they began to rationalize and as they opened the door yep there goes the jewelry and friends the same thing happened in the Adventist church. Today we have boys in our schools with earrings in their ears. Shame. They, and it is the norm. Shame. Brothers, you have people working at our institution. You open the door, buy them. They're not even, tell you something. You see, the problem is the Bible prophesied that a time will come where the people will not be able to blush. You know, I'm going to tell you something. You see, when I had my jewelry issue, I would never wear it to church. No, you're crazy. Lord of Hill, you want the, the roof open up on me? You must be crazy. Never. I'd put mine on when the sun went down. And if I'm going to the mall, and I told you, I remember one Sabbath, man, I was at the mall, and I saw the first elder broke the corner. Elder Williams. Williams. Lord have mercy. And I had to screw in back once. Man, I broke. <laughs> because the man of God was coming. Today, they will see the preacher, the elder. They don't care. They, they, can't, they, they can't even blush. It's the norm. It ought not be. It, show, it tells us that there has been a falling away, brothers and sisters. We never got married with the jewelry on. We knew that. That was a no-no thing with Adventists because we knew 
We, are, we were a biblical people. Today, I don't know what we are, brothers and sisters. And it got so bad. Ellen White issued a statement. Now, friends, I'm going to unpack this in, 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 in upcoming uh, next Sabbath that we bring to a close. But friends, this is plain. In other words, if you don't get this, then something is seriously wrong with your relationship with God. Ellen White wrote, and I'm going to give you the history of why she wrote, but I'm just going to quote. She says this. Please read now. I feel deeply over this leavening process. Or the falling away. Please read now, right? Which seems to be going on among us. This was written before she died in 1915. Watch it now. Back then. Please read now. In the conformity to custom and fashion. Now, friends, get this. You need to take a picture of this one now, friends. Because she's uttering the same sentiments that Peter wrote and Paul wrote. Because she was a prophet. Look what she says now. Not one penny should be spent for a circlet of gold to testify that we are married. Friend, did you hear that, brothers and sisters? Did you hear that? Did you see that this morning? This is, this is not in your handout. It's taken from test, special testimonies to ministers and, and workers. Not one penny, she said, should be spent for a circle of gold to, to attest that we are married. And she goes on to, to qualify now. We're going to break this down. We're gonna, but I'm just showing you that the prophet, the prophet stood where Peter stood. And remember, once the prophet was alive, wedding bands were off. Once the elders, once the prophet died, and Haskell and those guys came off the scene, by the time we hit the 80s, the 90s, Brother and sister, it, 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 it missed a T all over. The, the, the gold began to be poured in. And it began to be manifested on the people of God. Friends, I'm going to tell you something. If you are, an, if you are expecting the latter rain, it's not going to fall on any Seventh-day Adventists who have no finger rings on them finger and earrings. You, you need to make sure you, you got that. Not one penny should be spent for a circular goal to testify that we are married, friends. Now, either we're going to accept her as a prophet or we're going to reject her. We can't just accept Steps of Christ, you know, and Desire Ages, my favorite book, and we, these lover dubby books that we want. And they're, not, they're, they're hard, they're, they're real hard books, really, if you ask me. When it comes on to this, well, we're going to say, well, that was conjectural, and she was referring. No, 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 no. She was referring to the, and she, and she was addressing North America. She was addressing, and where do we live? We're in North America. Friends, what then? As Spurgeon says, oh, because God is slow to anger, we are slow to repentance. Friends, God is calling for a revival and a reformation. Friends, we are getting ready to cross over to Jordan, brothers and sisters. And I appeal to you as I appeal to myself. We need to Kadesh. We need to sanctify. We need to put away this strange God. And don't let no pastor tell you no foolishness. And some of you will hear this message and you, 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 you will consult that, that, uh, that, 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 that man that God don't even know. And he has one on his finger. The last person you want to ask about some jewelry is a man who has one on his finger. You don't need to consult no pastor. You need to consult the books. And I'm going to tell you something. Brothers and, sisters. and once the wedding band appears in the pastor's hand, you know he ain't saying nothing. Brothers and sisters. I, I got to be real with you. He's just there as a figurehead. But when it comes on to the deep things of God, he will say nothing. Year in, year out, until he is transferred and moved to another field, brothers and sisters. You need to get back to scripture and what the prophet says. And not some of these unfortunate people who are masquerading around the church with all kinds of degrees and don't know nothing. God is calling for a revival. And what then, brother? What I, I appeal to myself. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. The Bible says, let us be zealous there and repent. And what has happened now? Somebody said, well, Pastor, you mean to tell me I'm going to be lost because of figuring? Don't even insult me. I'm going to tell you what you're going to be lost over. Here it is. Ephesians 5, 6. 
let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Here it is, friends. We will be lost because of disobedience. We are told that obedience is the highest praise that a man can give to God. Trust and obey, for there is no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust. <laughs>